later. But that's now you know what you're in for. You, it, the barbecue is not entirely obligatory, but if you're riding in a, in a van, you may be stuck on a barbecue. So there yeah. may be, it's possible there could be a, a, a car that goes straight home from Frog River. They don't have vegan barbecue pig. They do have coleslaw. Coleslaw and white bread. You can make coleslaw in a sandwich or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, for the last talk of the morning, we're very happy to have Chris Leninger, also from Urbana. And, uh, same time. <laughs> Uh, so this, this, I actually took a picture of the board since I erased it, and this said, Mono is in the braid and mapping class group to be Um Okay, so, let's see, I have 11 of them. Um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to be here. This is, this has got to be one of the most beautiful campuses uh, I've ever been to make. Um, so, right, I'm going to continue talking about what Spencer talked about, uh, and that's free by cyclic groups. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the sort of uh, geometry and dynamics um, aspects of it. And uh, so let me just remind you, uh, I felt, I usually don't like to write stuff on the board ahead of time. It's like, oh, you're playing catch up. But we just saw this. Uh, so what was the setup? So we have an expanding irreducible train track map, F, from gamma to gamma. Uh, and here's an example. So there's there's an example F. Um, no, no, this is the only one. <laughs> so, um, uh, and then we build this mapping torus X. Uh, there's the suspension semi-flow psi. Uh, pi one of X is the group G, which is the semi-direct product. Uh, pi one of the graph uh, with z, and uh, and then sort of the main focus for the first part is this cone of sections. So this was this open convex hull of the rays through those cohomology classes, which were dual to sections of the semiflow. A uh, couple other bits of notation: h was this first homology mod torsion, uh, so the torsion-free abelianization, and then uh, this m was this McMullen polynomial. So the first, uh, the first part of the talk is going to be uh, mostly focused on sort of analyzing this cone of sections and trying to explain why the cone of sections is this uh, cone uh, associated to the McMullen polynomial that, that Spencer uh, uh, defined. So, and along the way, we'll sort of see several different equivalent formulations. So different ways of describing what this cone of sections is. Uh, the second part. Um, uh, oh, and also um, connection to uh, this polynomial. Um, second part. So there was uh, this theorem that Spencer wrote down that the McMullen polynomial, when you specialize it to a cohomology class, uh, a primitive integral class in the cone of sections gives you the characteristic polynomial. So I want to explain sort of why that's true. Uh, and the point is that there's some unifying object here that sort of describes all, the pol uh, all of these uh, polynomials, or all of these uh, modules uh, simultaneously, right? Each section gives you, uh, gives you a sort of graph module. Um, and so uh, there's a way of sort of putting all of those together and seeing them all from one, uh, one perspective. So there's this, what we call the module of transversals. Uh, so this will unify sort of all graph modules. All right, so remember this graph module was, you look in the universal abelian cover, you take the pre-image of your section, that's some infinite graph with lots of different copies, and you look at uh, this module generated by the edges with this relation. 
So there's some single module that sort of describes all of those simultaneously. About that. And then if there's time, um, I'll talk about some uh, geometric structures on this two complex, which are associated to uh, classes in the cone. And um, uh, the reason I want to mention this is that this brings in now the real classes. Somehow, a lot of uh, a lot of the focus is on these sections, which are all about the primitive integral classes. But the cone is this cone in the real cohomology. Um, and so you might wonder what these real classes correspond to, and what what does this polynomial tell you about those? And again, in analogy with McMullen's Teichmuller polynomial, uh, it turns out that it tells you quite a lot. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, five minutes. So, where's the picture? I have to stay very focused on my notes, not wander around. So the first thing, uh, sections. Okay, so, <clears throat> Uh, if you're thinking about motivation from the three-manifold point of view, or from the manifold point of view, when you have uh, this vibration of the circle and the suspension flow, and you're looking at other vibrations, so those other vibrations, um, when you want to take convex hulls of you know, the dual classes, uh, it's not clear what that should mean geometrically. But in the manifold setting, you can, there is a way of making sense of that geometrically, namely, Think about, uh, let's say, the representing this cohomology class as a closed one form. Right, so you have a vibration, you can pull back the volume form in the circle, and you get a closed nowhere vanishing one form. But it's more than just nowhere vanishing, it's, it's, it evaluates positively on the vector field that generates the suspension flow. Okay? So you can think about these different vibrations as corresponding to closed nowhere vanishing one forms that evaluate positively on the vector field that generates the suspension flow. And while there's, there's, I mean, you can talk about that in the, the setting of real cohomology, you don't have to have uh, an integral cohomology class. So this cone in the setting of a manifold with, uh, with the suspension flow of a, of a, let's say, you write your manifold as a mapping torus of some diffeomorphism, the, the kinds of objects that you want to think about are closed one forms that evaluate positively on the vector field generating the flow. And so it turns out that, well, even though we don't have a smooth manifold, you can still define something like a closed one form. So, in fact, you could, if you wanted, actually define sort of closed one forms uh, and you know, try to do some differential topology, but it turns out to be much simpler to, uh, to think about what a closed one form gives you. So what it gives you, um, or I should say, the interpretation of what it gives you, and I'll explain this a little bit more, uh, is the following. So give a definition, a closed, well, there's sort of two adjectives here, flow regular, closed one form, on X so on a manifold if you have a closed one form you can take a little simply connected set a uh, simply connected open set say and you can integrate the one form to get a function so if you want you can think about the closed one form as a bunch of functions on your on open on an open cover for which on the overlap the functions that you get are the differences are locally constant so, so that's what a that's what a closed one form is going to be. So, uh, a closed one form on X is uh, a collection of functions omega, and well, we could take it on arbitrary open sets, but let's just say on the two cells. So T here and X, the two cell, and maybe you want to think that the two cells are embedded; they don't have to be. Uh, you should really modify this. Let's just think that all of our two cells are actually embedded. We've got uh, functions defined on 
these open sets, well, so that whenever I have two of these that overlap, the difference should be uh, locally constant. So the first property is that the difference of these functions is locally constant uh, on t intersects c prime. So these are some edges. You're missing okay. prime here. Oh. So it's locally constant on the intersections. So that's what it means to be a closed one form. Okay? And now I want some property which is analogous to this uh, flow, this uh, evaluating positively on the vector field that generates the flow. Uh, and that's basically what, what Spencer mentioned. We want the, the restrictions of flow lines to be uh, orientation preserving. local diffeomorphisms or homeomorphisms. Okay? So what should, what's the picture you should have in mind? So here's, here's a two cell uh, inside of here and we have, the, we have the suspension flow that looks like this. Suspension semi-flow. And then we have this function to, to R. So we could look at the fibers of that map uh, and those fibers should be transverse to the flow. Okay? So that's the picture. So again, on a manifold, a closed one form, you integrate on small open sets, you get functions like this, so that on the overlap, the, the difference is locally constant. OK, well, what can you do with a closed one form? Well, you, can, you get a cohomology class. Why do you get a cohomology class? Because you can integrate. any closed one form along paths. OK, but so what does that mean? So if I have a path, well, the path might run through some different two cells inside of my cell structure. And I just think about subdividing my path into arcs that lie entire, entirely inside of the two cells. And I take the difference in the values of my function on this two cell at the endpoints, and I just add that up. Okay? So if you actually were integrating a closed one form in the classical sense to get your function, that's exactly what the, the, um, the integral of the path would be. Okay, so out of this you get a cohomology class. So every closed one form gives you a cohomology class. Uh, and then, well, it's not too hard to believe that this cone of sections it's exactly the classes that can be represented by flow regular closed one form. So, proposition S is the set of cohomology classes such that uh, omega is a closed. Uh, flow regular. Okay, so uh, let me not, let me just sort of say what the proof is. So if I have a section, right, I have this map to the circle, I can just take that map to the circle, restrict it to a two cell, lift that to the universal cover, that gives me a map to R, it's well defined up to covering transformations. But I get, so I get a, a well-defined map to, to uh, R up to covering transformations uh, on each of the two cells. And on the overlaps, the, the, uh, those two functions, the differences are locally constant. So every integral class gives me a closed flow regular one form. The flow regularity just comes from, as Spencer described, those maps to the circle are supposed to map flow lines locally diffeomorphically under the circle. OK. so. Um, and then the other nice thing is, well, this thing on the right is an open cone, right? If I take two closed flow regular one forms, I can add them together, so add the functions on the two cells. And if they were locally constant on the uh, intersections, the differences were locally constant on the intersections before I add them, then they are after, and they scale nicely. So this thing on the right is a nice open convex uh, subset of, uh, of H1, and it contains all of the integral classes. And so the last thing, uh, that are dual dissections. 
So the last thing you, you want to see is that if I have something like this, which actually represents a primitive integral class, well, I can integrate that to get a, a map to S1. So saying that it's an integral class means that when I integrate over loops, I get integrated. So that means that when I integrate over any path, I get a well-defined number mod z. So I can define a map to the circle, which is this sort of vibration. Hey, Chris, just to make sure I understand this restriction, the, you're adding things, the restriction, the pull-out condition, just comes from the derivatives and positives, you add two positive numbers, so positive. So, you know, what you want. Say that again? So uh, I'm trying to understand, you said you can add these guys and you get another one. I'm trying to understand why condition two is satisfied by the sum. Oh, why? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So it's just adding. Yeah, yeah, the derivatives are, yeah, the derivatives add up. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Cal 1. Okay, I guess Cal 2. <laughs> 3. Okay, um, right. So, uh, okay, so this is another way now to think geometrically about what the elements of this cone are. So there are these, these flow regular one forms. And one nice sort of thing that this tells you, okay, so now the real classes have some interpretation. But if you also think about the three manifold setting, we have a closed one form, um, uh, nowhere vanishing one form on a three manifold say, you get a foliation, right, tangent to the kernels of the one form. So there's a foliation here as well, right, it's sort of, uh, what are the leaves? Well, you take, you take the fibers of these maps and then you sort of glue them together along the edges and you sort of take maximal path connected subsets, right, and that's going to give you uh, sort of decomposition of this two complex into, well, they look like graphs, right? But in general, these graphs are somehow much more complicated, right? In the integral case, these graphs are the sections. In the real case, these graphs are actually dense. Each one of the connected components is dense inside of this two complex, okay? So um, each real cohomology class gives you some foliation of the two complex, which is transverse to the flow. And so we'll come back to that at the end if there's time. Okay, but we're sort of, we've now sort of taken our cone of sections and we've given another uh, geometric description. Let me describe another um, uh, way of thinking about what this cone is. This requires a bit more work. Uh, so this is in an unpublished thesis of, of Wang um, from around 2002. Um, and we give, uh, uh, another proof that sort of can't really understand what he was doing, uh, but uh, but anyway, sort of it's there. Um, so what does the theorem say? So another way of thinking about what this cone is is it's it's exactly the set of cohomology classes which evaluate positively on closed orbits. Okay, so what does this mean? So we have our... Is greater than zero. Uh, yeah. So we have this uh, flow, and we can look at the closed orbits of the flow. And we'll analyze these a lot more uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, but there are lots of them, lots and lots of closed orbits. We can think about the value of that, that closed orbit. I can think of it as, you know, uh, it's a curve inside of my two complex, so it's some homology class. I can evaluate my cohomology class on it. And uh, I want it to evaluate positively. Okay? And that's, that's another description of what it means to be in the cone. Now, one direction of one sort of inclusion is sort of immediate from this, right? If I have a closed orbit and I take a closed flow regular one form and I integrate that one form over that closed orbit, of course I'm going to get something positive, right? So, I mean, that's, that's exactly what the sort of flow regularity uh, tells you. So, the fact that everything like this uh, is inside of here is sort of straightforward. The other direction is quite a bit more complicated. I need to take a cohomology class, know something combinatorial, it's evaluating positively on these cohomology classes, uh, and then from that build a closed flow regular one form. Uh, and that you do by an explicit construction. You do some subdivisions. Uh, and then you ask Spencer, who's uh, the mastermind here, and is, uh, is able to actually construct these sections. 
So, um, right. So this, uh, if you have questions, ask Spencer. <laughs> All right. So we're still aiming for a relation to the McMullen polynomial, and this cone that was defined there. Uh, and now we've, we've gone from the cone of sections to something sort of geometric to something maybe dynamical slash combinatorial. Okay, so we're heading towards uh, this description uh, in terms of the McMullen polynomial. So for this, we need to think about what the closed orbits of this flow look like. So on the one hand, we have closed orbits of the flow. Now remember, x was right, the mapping torus of this train track map. So a closed orbit is going to meet the graph in finitely many points. That section is going to meet finitely many points. And you can think about those finitely many points as just points which are permuted by the, the map f. Right? So if I have a periodic point of f, that gives me a closed orbit. And every closed orbit gives me a periodic point. So the closed orbits of the psi are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the f orbits of f periodic points. Right? Now, where do I get periodic points of f? So the periodic points of f we can view uh, as coming from, or we can find them from the, the transition matrix, or maybe more directly or more simply, from the associated directed graph. Okay? So there's the transition matrix for F. And here's the directed graph. So what is this? This is a graph that has uh, vertices and one-to-one -one correspondence with the, the, uh, the rows and columns. So in this case, the rows and columns are correspond to uh, the, uh, the edges of my original uh, graph. That guy up there, that was gamma. So each edge gives me a row, and uh, each edge gives me a column. And then I have an edge, a directed edge in my graph from, uh, well, let's just look at this. So I have a directed edge from B to A when I have a positive entry in the AB uh, uh, entry of the matrix. So the AB entry of the matrix is positive, I get an edge. If I have, so here the AD pot entry is positive, so I have two edges. Two here, so I get two edges. Okay, so that's the associated directed graph. You're probably all familiar with this. Now, the claim is that every cycle inside of this graph, directed cycle, gives me uh, a closed, or sorry, gives me a periodic orbit. So directed, let's just call them cycles, in this graph give me uh, F periodic points. So why? So think about, here's a simple cycle. It goes uh, just from this vertex to itself. So that corresponds to, in this picture, the fact that I've got, when I look at this map, this edge D, right, it maps over a whole bunch of edges. In particular, it maps over D. Okay, so there's, if you like, there's a little segment of this edge which maps over the whole edge. Or if you want, I'm identifying this little bit of D with the whole part of D. Okay? That identification is a map from that interval to itself. So there's a fixed point. Okay? So inside of here, inside of this little piece, I get a fixed point of the map F. Okay? So that's a periodic point of period one, which corresponds to the fact that this loop has length one. So if I take any other cycle in here, length K, I can see, I can find a fixed point or a periodic point of period K. Yes. Is it power of that matrix positive? Yes. Strictly positive. Yeah, in this case, the power of the matrix is strictly positive. Okay, so every cycle inside of the graph by Brouwer fixed point theorem gives me a periodic point. And every periodic point, well, actually can give me multiple cycles because sometimes that fixed point, point could be at a vertex. So I can get, I get some <coughs> finite to one map. Now, some of these cycles are special. Uh, these are the circuits. So uh, 
the circuits, these are cycles which are embedded. Okay. And there's only finally many simple circuits. They have to visit each, uh, they have to, they can only visit each vertex once, okay? Um, they can only go over each edge once, they only have finally many. Here are the finally many circuits in this, uh, in this graph. Okay, so you can just start at A and then look at all the possible circuits that you get. Uh, and then it turns out that's everything except this little guy. So you just write them all down. Okay, there's seven. Okay, so this is some special set, call it Y, the circuits in this directed graph. And, well, associated to each cycle, so let me, let me sort of have some notation. Associated to each cycle, I get a periodic point, and that periodic point gives me a closed orbit. So let me call that closed orbit O gamma. Okay? Well, there's also the, the closed orbits associated to the circuits, and the nice property, so just thinking about sort of how you build from the cycles the, the periodic points and hence the, the closed orbits, if I have some, so every, every circuit, uh, every cycle, uh, gamma is actually can be thought of as a union of circuits. Right? So every time I come back to where I start, I build some circuit sort of break that off and I continue on, build more circuits. So I can think of every cycle as a, as a union of circuits. Okay. Gamma looks like Y1 union dot union YK. And, well, the nice property about the, the closed orbit associated to this uh, cycle is that its homology class is related to the homology classes of these Guys. Namely, it's just the product. And what's the point? Well, the point is, right, you think about inside of your big cycle, when you do a little circuit, right, how do I find the corresponding closed orbit while well, I'm looking for a fixed point in that edge, right? But there's another fixed point in that edge which corresponds to uh, this guy. Okay? And that fixed point is pretty close, so you can actually find a little homology between this guy and that the, the orbit corresponding to the cycle and what's left, and then you just iterate. Okay, so this homology class is equal to this one. So these are, remember, these are elements of H. Okay? So for every cycle inside of this graph, we get, uh, we can write that homology class of the corresponding orbit as a product of these homology classes. Now, if you think about this description, so these are the classes which evaluate positively on all closed orbits. In fact, we don't need all closed orbits. We just need the ones corresponding to the circuits. So this is also the set of homology classes such that U evaluates positively on the circuits. Okay? So if I have something which evaluates positively on the circuits, well, every homology class of every closed orbit is a product of these guys. So if I'm positive on each of these, then I'm going to be positive <coughs> on this. It's a homomorphism. Make sense? So, so you're saying this, this, not, this corresponds on top is, is more than just set theoretic. There's an isomorphism between subspace of the homology of this graph and exactly. the subspace of the homology right. That's right. Yep. So, yeah, so if you like, you could think about going further over to the to the homology, and this map from cycles sort of uh, is sort of additive on the span of this sort of mono whatever semi group spanned by the the um, uh, cycles. Okay. So now we've taken this thing, which is a priori may be hard to check. Uh, and turn it into something which is actually not only easy to check, but these are integral classes. So this describes this cone of sections as a rational cone. It's actually defined by finitely many rational inequalities. Okay? Okay. All right. So... Now, what's the connection with the McMullen polynomial? So,
to describe that, I need one other. Uh, I need to take this and enlarge it a little bit. So let me take y uh, and take y prime, which is just sets of pairwise disjoint circuits. So I look at all the set of sets of circuits, which are pairwise disjoint. So you might, uh, uh, so you might think of that as somehow some sort of natural uh, object like a curve complex. And uh, this has been described in the literature as a curve complex. So McMullen and also uh, Hiranaka and Agam Kafir and Rafi. And um, when you mean uh, disjoint? You mean disjoint? Yeah, like not intersecting at all. Like yeah. not even at vertices. Not even at vertices. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and then you can extend this map from y over to the to h to a map from y prime. So <coughs> I'll think of the map from y prime to h, which sends uh, any one of these guys to the product of the homology classes of uh, each of the closed orbits associated to each of the circuits. Okay. So now we've got some other larger preferred set of homology classes. And so the, the theorem that we want to use here is due to... Do you want y to be the union of those? Y1 to y k or is it just like a It's just a set. Of those it's just this, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I just want to think about it as this set. Okay, so theorem, this is due to one down here. Naka Rafi is that you can describe this polynomial that Spencer wrote down in terms of the right, you remember that you have you take this graph gamma, you go to the universal dealing cover, you write down this module, you write down this matrix, up to units in so up to units in Z of H, you can write this polynomial as 1 plus the sum over, uh, well, over all of these y's and y prime minus 1 to the number of components of y homology class of that orbit inverse. Okay? So let me just again, you've got all these sets of pairwise disjoint circuits associated to each one of those is a homology class. Okay. Now you've got some collection of homology classes. And this polynomial, this polynomial that Spencer wrote down, can be up to, well, if you like, you can just multiply by x to the uh, dimension of the matrix, and you get exactly the expression you had. Okay. So it looks like 1 plus this linear combination of the inverses of those homology classes. All right? So now you can see. Uh, Sorry, what, why is it? I thought the polynomial had some of the variable and the cohomology class or the exponents. So. Yeah, right. So we could pick, we could pick, uh, we could pick a basis uh, and write down the polynomial in terms of a basis. So if we do that, then we replace these by the variables. That's right. Now, if we specialize, so what does specialization mean? Let me just write it here. So specializing this polynomial, it looks like 1 plus the sum of uh, minus 1 to the number of components times this, my, well, we want to call it y, y, oh, no, I don't want to do that. T, t to the minus uh, u evaluated on this cohomology class, uh, u. So minus here because of the inverse. Okay, that's the specialization. And now, so as a corollary, uh, we see that the cone of sections is this cone that Spencer wrote down. Remember, what was the cone? The cone was, well, you look at this, and you look at all of the terms here. Uh, and there's a slight lie here, but um, we'll see if you catch it. Okay, so there's a bunch of terms here. And then I, I look at the homology classes, which evaluate 
on these guys less than zero. Well, when I evaluate on these guys less than zero, the inverse means evaluating on this guy positively. Right? And that was what the cone of sections was. That was this, this previous theorem. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Where's the line? Yeah, so the, the, the connection with sections. I mean, sorry, not the sections. But... Okay, sorry. <coughs> so, yeah, so yeah, maybe you just sort of recap the whole thing. So, you have the cone of sections. You can think of those as closed one forms, flow regular. Uh, you can also think about it as things that evaluate positively on closed orbits. Right, orbit, I meant orbits and circuits. Oh, yeah, so the point, right, so the relationship, oh, I just erased it. The relationship was, right, every circuit gives you a closed orbit. And evaluating, so, and the polynomial is defined in terms of the orbits associated to those circuits. Does that make sense? Is this, is the same statement you're going to surface this, for example? Is the same, oh, can you write down the polynomial? Uh, yeah, you should be able to. I think so. Some form like this. The type of polynomial has some, uh, the calculation is slightly different than, than, than this calculation. You divide by something corresponding to the switch condition. So yeah, it may be worth saying, so there, you know, the, one of the, well, actually, I'm going to get to it in a minute, but, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to some relationship between that. So, any questions on this? That was the end of the first part. So what was the lie? <laughs> but, oh, sorry. The lie is, right, you have to worry about cancellation, right? And, and when you write down your polynomial, you only want to take those terms where the coefficient is non-zero. Uh, and so there may be some cancellation here. So you have to sort of work just like that much. OK. Um, right. OK, so now I want to get on to, um, so now we've sort of seen you know, the different ways of thinking about what this cone is. And um, the next thing I want to do is describe sort of how the polynomial, so right, I mean, a priori this polynomial, even in this form, depends on the, the, um, the particular section you picked, right? Because the, the section tells you how to specify the preferred orbits. Um, but certainly in the other form of the polynomial, there's some, you have to sort of, uh, you're just given some transition matrix. So here, Spencer had like, this was a T inverse, and this was a 1. So if you remember Spencer's matrix, it looked a lot like this, except there were a bunch of Ts. So if you want to think about like the specialization, right? in terms of his basis, T, you just evaluate uh, at to be 1. And then if you replace all of Spencer's Ts with 1s, you can exactly get this matrix. So the specialization for that case uh, is when uh, you're evaluating uh, to be zero on those classes. The T there is not the flow direction, it's sort of the, the deck transformations corresponding to the components. Sorry, say that again, T is? T is corresponding to the deck transformations. Deck transformations of the component, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's, that's right. right. Not the flow direction. Yeah, so there's the, yeah, there's the, there's the deck transformation which permutes the components, and then there are deck transformations which preserve a component of the three dimensional graph. Okay, so, So how do you relate all of these? Um, how do you relate all of these objects, all these different ways of fibering, and in particular the polynomials for those? Um, so we're going to define a new module. But before we do that, let's. I want to. I want to sort of uh, describe or sketch sort of the proof of this theorem that Spencer mentioned. So um, if theta is uh, or theta is a section, so section. Xi and f theta. So remember, this was the first return map. Then um, f theta is an expanding irreducible train track map. Okay, so, so why is this true? So let me draw a picture. 
So first, let's say, so E here, let's take this to be any edge. And what we need to see in order for this to be an expanding irreducible train track map, first of all, to be a train track map, we need to know that the restriction to this edge of all iterations of this first return map is always locally injected. Take this edge and it's sort of never do any backtracking. Okay, so let's, let's look at that first. So what are the edges of this graph? So it turns out that you also, I mean, you want, train track maps should take vertices to vertices. So you have to sort of be careful in the way you define the graph structure. So if this is my two cell, so here's a two cell, I've got my suspension flow, and then I've got my section. So I don't know what it looks like, maybe like that. Okay, so here's my section theta. So you want to grab, you want to define this, the, the graph structure so that the endpoints, the vertices of my edges, eventually they flow into vertices of the original graph gamma. Okay, so it's sort of a technical point, but um, let's just say here's some edge E. Okay, so here's theta, and edge E looks like some, so this edge E is a, uh, it's just an arc transverse to this, uh, to the flow. So the flow goes like this. Now, I'm supposed to see that when I iterate my first return map, this always remains locally injected. So, but I need to use the fact that my original map, F, was a train track map. So, my original map, so down here along the bottom somewhere, I have an edge of my original graph, gamma. So, down here, there's some edge E naught. So, this is some edge E naught of the original graph. And now, what does it mean for F to be a train track? So, that means that um, if, I, right, if I take this edge and I, and I look at its images, it never backtracks. It's always locally injective. I can turn that into a statement about what happens above this edge under the semi-flow. Okay? So F being a train track map, the original guide being train track, means that if I look at the map that goes from this edge crossed with R plus into X, so I take a point on my edge and I take a time S and I flow for that time S, that edge. Okay, so I take a point and I just flow for any time I want. That gives me a map from this edge cross R plus. And you should think about just taking this and there's sort of a strip above this. So the original map being train track means that this map is locally injected. Right? So that map is locally injected. Well, if I restrict to the bit above here, I mean, in some sense, the, the part above here, I can do the same thing. So I can take E cross R plus and map to X. That's also locally injected. Okay? And again, the map is the same thing. I pick a point and I just flow for time s. Okay? So if this guy's locally injected, this is locally injected. But if this is locally injected, then the first return map is also locally injected. So first return map, you can think of as sort of showing up, you know, in this strip above there. So you see all these different places where it hit. Those are the first return maps. So I'm out of room. Sorry, this is horrible. Right here. So this means that f theta is train track. Chris, how do you know that like E is contained? It essentially, it looks like the projection down the gamma is contained in an edge. How do you know it's not like? Yeah, that's right. So all I know is that this two cell. So really, I should think about this edge is somewhere down here. Somewhere down here, there's an edge. So the two cells. So we didn't talk too much about the cell structure, mm -hmm. but basically, you know, how do you? One way to get the cell structure in the mapping for us is to take your edge and then flow it up until you get to the top. Mm -hmm. And that's your two cell. Mm -hmm. So this edge inside of here in the mapping torus would just be the bottom edge. But how do you know that it's a little E doesn't go a lot long? I mean how do you oh, know this you guy. E, yeah, oh right. So that's down the, the so, yeah, so that's the graph structure path. on theta. So that you define the graph structure on mm -hmm. theta. Um, you, you could first take it by the vertices are the intersections with like the vertical one cells in this picture. Mm -hmm. But then you need to subdivide it further along points which eventually flow into the vertices of gamma okay. in order for the map to be, to map, you know, in order for this first return map to map vertices to vertices. So you have to, you do have to take your map to the circle and perturb it a little bit so that, uh, you know, the, you perturb it a little bit and then subdivide uh, so that your vertices in the first return map map into vertices. And so in particular, all of the all of the one cells will always be contained inside of two cells. I mean that's part I guess that's that's part of the, the But for a train track, I mean you don't want like your, your vertices, I mean, to just be 
Yeah, so you do sometimes you don't want valence two, right? Yeah, you so you have to allow so right. So we have to allow valence two vertices. Uh, and then you have to prove that everything you like about you like that you mean, even if there's a valence two, there's no folding. Yeah, exactly. You need to show there's no folding, and that's and that's sort of also contained in this proof, right? So if there's a valence two vertex, it has to show up in the interior of a two cell, and then inside of this two cell, again, you know, below there, there's a there's an arc of the edge that remains locally injected, and so you never fold uh, this at this vertex. You always have two gates. Okay. Anyway, that's yeah. Okay, so the uh, so this is the sort of explanation why you get a train track map. And now, without sort of writing anything, why is it expanding? Well, what does it mean for f to be expanding? It means I take this edge and it eventually maps over everything. So if you like, if I take this edge and I look at forward iterates under f of this edge, I eventually get all of gamma. The union of all of those is gamma. Okay. Well, if the union of all of those is gamma, that means when I take this edge and I flow forward then eventually I hit all of x. And if I hit all of x, that's true not only for this edge, but actually for any small segment inside of this edge. Any small segment, that will eventually map over everything. So if that maps over everything, then everything above here maps over everything, which means the first return map eventually hits everything, which means it's expanding or reducing. Okay, so that's, uh, that's basically sort of why uh, these first return maps are expanding your useful train track maps. And you're right, this is not in the classical sense. And in fact, it's sort of even worse because, as Spencer mentioned, these, the induced maps need not be pi 1 injective. So you have to sort of, if you want to deduce information about like the associated uh, ascending H and N extensions and those monodromies, you have to do some work. It turns out that all of the information about sort of stretch factors uh, survives in this level of generality. In the case when like your initial monodromy was say fully irreducible, yeah, if one of these sections turns out to have say uh, like a like an automorphism as its monodromy, do you also know that it's? That's a great question. Okay. So we don't know that on the entire cone, but we do know sort of on a subcone. So there's a nice open cone inside of there. We define our first paper that where you do know this fully irreducibility, but because these other representatives aren't as nice can't say, I mean, that, you know, we use Ilya's yeah. Yeah, characterization, yeah. and um, yeah, you just don't know uh, if that's, if such a thing holds in this weaker sort of set. Other questions? Okay. Um, so, okay, so what what is it that I want you to take from this? Um, so what I want you to take away from this is that for any section inside of this, uh, inside of this uh, x, the edges of the sections are these arcs transverse to the semi-flow inside of two cells, okay? And the vertices eventually flow into the vertices of gamma. So let me just write that down. So all edges of sections, any section of psi, are what we call transversals. Plus, so transversals, these are arcs. Um, alpha contained inside of a two cell. They should be transverse to the um, uh, transverse to the flow, and the edges. Oh, sorry, the endpoints uh, should eventually flow into. eventually flow into the vertices of the original graph gamma. Okay? Now, the original map was this expanding your disciple train track map, so the backward orbit of, of vertices uh, under the semi-flow is actually dense. So maybe that was part of your question, Matt, about how you can arrange this. The backward orbit of the vertices is always some dense set um, inside of X. So. Uh, so really, you know, inside of your inside of your two cell, uh, there's this dense countable set of of flow lines that eventually flow into the vertex set of gamma. Okay. Um, so these are transversals, and now from the set of transversals, 
not in X because somehow we need to, we want to think about all of these sort of different vibrations. Usually it's nice to think about a vibration in terms of the infinite cyclic cover. So we think about them all simultaneously in terms of this universal Helium cover, which Spencer mentioned. So H here is the covering group. We have the lifted semi-flow. Okay? And we look at transversals not here actually, but here, and we define a module of transversals. So T of, uh, let me call it T of, of psi tilde. This is the module of transversals. So what is it? It's the, it's the free Z module generated by transversals up to some uh, relations. And those relations should somehow mirror the relations that you see in the graph module. So remember there, the module was, well, I'll remind you in a minute what the, the module was. So we have the free Z module generated by the transversals, so that are all those arcs. That's, boy, that's a lot, right? So we, we want something finally presented at the end of the day. So we have some relations, namely we have uh, subdivision. So if I can subdivide my, my transversal into two other transversals, so I need to pick a point which flows into uh, a vertex of gamma. Okay, so I define alpha to be equivalent to alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And then there's also um, flow. So if I have some transversal alpha, and I can flow possibly through a bunch of different two cells to get to another transversal, alpha prime, then I'm going to declare alpha and alpha prime to be equivalent. Okay? So I subdivide and I flow and I get some equivalence relation. Okay? And I look at the the module, which is the quotient by uh, these relations, the free module. Okay, so what was the, remember, there was also the graph module. And that's lifted flow, right? Sorry? That's lifted flow, right? Lifted flow. Sorry, yes, this is, this is, this is an x tilde. Right. This is side tilde. Okay, so um, what's the, let me just remind you, there is this graph module. So we have a section inside of X, put it on here, and above that section we have its pre-image, okay? This was this bunch of copies of covers of, uh, of theta. And then there was this module of, uh, of this section, which was generated by the edges. And there's this equivalence relation that an edge was equivalent to the subdivided path, the, the sum of the, the edges in the path that it flows to. Well, I can send that, I can think of that edge, as I was explaining, is a transversal. So I can map this graph module to the module of transversals. Okay? And I just send the edge to the edge. So you need to check that the relations here, right? map to relations here. So if you think about map from free modules, the relations map to relations. But that's not too hard to see. If I, if I have some edge which flows into some you know, concatenation of edges, well, I can think about first subdividing into the thing that it's going to flow into. Uh, so that's subdivision. And then I can flow forward until I hit the thing that actually that's sum. OK? So certainly every relation here maps to a relation here. So I get a nice, oh, and I should have said, right, this. Um, this T of psi, this is H tilde is acting on the transversals again by pullback. So this is also a Z of H module. And this is actually a Z of H module homomorphism. And the theorem is that it's an isomorphism. It's iso. Okay, and I don't have time to say anything about it, so I won't. Uh, but basically, you just need to make sure that all the relations in T psi can be deduced from relations in T of theta hat. Is this supposed to be E and both sides of the arrow value? Yes, so I think of an edge as a transversal. So I map the edge right, to the, so yeah. Okay. I don't know what else to call it. By abusive notation. By abusive notation, E map. Okay, 
Um, How could that build be asked? That's right. Exactly. It's clear. <laughs> it's the identity. Uh, okay. So, um, right. So as a corollary, we see that the polynomial, this graph polynomial, which is the fitting, the GCD of the fitting, the GCD of the fitting ideal for the graph module is the same as the, up to units, is the same as the GCD of the fitting ideal for the module transverses, okay? So as a corollary, well, corollary together with, you know, thinking a little bit, um, if I specialize uh, my polynomial for any section, I get the characteristic polynomial of, of F theta, or I should say the, the transition matrix for F theta, okay? Again, this is up to, up to units, which in this case just means plus or minus T to the K. Okay, um, all right, five minutes, four minutes. Let me, uh, let me just say that I mean, at this point, so Spencer mentioned that we sort of appealed to this work of McMullen. Um, and uh, using the work of McMullen, you see that you get this nice function. So that's all about prone Frobenius matrices with entries in the ring of Laurent polynomials. So there's some sort of abstract machinery that he develops, which is applicable not only to the type 1 polynomial, but to the polynomial we define and also the polynomial. Uh, Echo and company defined. And so there's some sort of, once you get to that point, you can appeal to, uh, to that, um, that sort of his, his sort of machinery. So it's getting to that point. And let me say two things. One is coming back to the three manifold setting, which you know, we mentioned, I said it would come back to. So in the three manifold setting, the way that Nick Mullen sort of um, defines his polynomial, so he calculates the polynomial using this, the same sort of a graph module type construction, um, using train track representatives for the pseudo also. But the, the actual, I mean, the definition of the module is in terms of something like this module transversals, except in his setting, you have a three manifold and you have the stable lamination for your pseudo model. So if you spend that, suspend that, you get a two dimensional lamination in the three manifold. And you can look at transverse measures on that, okay? In the free group setting, there's no sort of, there's no sort of transverse measures on things. So there are currents, but that turns out to not be a good place to look. Um, and in this, and in particular here, there's no sort of, there's no sort of transverse measure on uh, any sort of lamination in this picture. Instead, associated to the matrix, this transition matrix, you can think about there's a right and a left eigenvalue, or eigenvector. One of the eigenvectors corresponds to transverse measures on the, the lamination. The other eigenvector corresponds to length functions on the graph, right? And it corresponds to, you know, you apply your map, how does the length stretch? The other one corresponds to how does the uh, transverse measure change? Okay, we don't have a transverse measure, but we do have sort of how length stretch uh, under this. And so really what we're capturing with this polynomial is something about, you know, how length stretch. So this is where the sort of picture with the three manifolds diverges quite a bit. It's sort of loss of, of, sort of duality, if you like. And, um, and so that's sort of, you know, where the direction that we go. From that, though, uh, I think I maybe have a minute. Um, from that you can, uh, so you know, this eigenvector for this matrix, right, I said this corresponds to length functions. So if you want, you can use the eigenvector to define length functions on the edges uh, of this graph. And the fact that it's an eigenvector for this prone for being eigenvalue means that when you apply the map, you're exactly doing a homothet by that eigenvalue. And so it turns out that that picture persists even in the real cohomology classes. So if you think about your real cohomology class, you have this two complex and this foliation by, well, there's this associated, right, one, one, uh, closed one form, 
you have the, the foliation, um, which are graphs. And you can think about flowing. So it turns out you can reparameterize your flow so that these graphs just map homeomorphically onto one onto the next. And there's a metric on this two complex, one that's associated to the cohomology class, so that the restrict, so that metric, that metric defines a path metric on these graphs. And as you flow forward, you're actually stretching by a constant amount. So it's uh, anyway, if you know the three manifold picture and you know the sort of Teichmuller flow picture uh, that the McMullen develops, this is uh, this is a sort of analog in this setting. And the, the metrics have lots of nice properties. They're constant curvature Ramanian metrics on the two cells. Um, and uh, anyway, I guess I am out of time, so I'll stop. <laughs>